Today on Zero Lanon, this is part two of rebuilding this blue laser HUD. In part one, I wrapped up the video when I found out that the color mending lenses on the inside were damaged, and I have my thoughts as to how that happened. Later on in the video, I'll talk more about that and hopefully do some tests to confirm whether or not that's the case. Now, I did find out who made this laser, and it is an old font laser. So, good brand, just over 10 years old. Now, I did contact Kavan, and surprisingly, they had still in their old stock brand new lenses and lens carriers so the first thing in this video i'll be doing is installing the lenses in the lens carriers so that they go in i already did the uh four here that uh, i started on in the part one uh so i do know that the lenses work they work better than the original ones and i'm very happy to see that i'm very happy that kavan had those old lenses in stock so big thanks to that so uh, once i get the new lenses installed uh, the next thing is is to set the uh, focus and then to install the knife edge uh, mirrors. And some of those uh, knife edge mirrors right here. And uh, I'll be aligning that. Once those are aligned, I'll be adjusting the current on the driver for the full output. And once again, I'm going to be running the 1.6 watt laser diode at about 1.4 watts. So there will be a little bit of headroom on there and give my client a long uh, output life on the laser. And uh, after that, just a couple of things I want to do just to make sure that the lens problem doesn't happen again the first problem i notice is that the uh, tecs on the inside of the laser head get really cold uh, colder than i think they should be getting um, and that causes condensation to come into the laser there's a bad seal so the first thing is that i want to uh, adjust the resistance where the thermistor comes in which uh, senses the temperature of the brass block on the inside sets the temperature for the laser diodes I want to make the laser diodes not run so cold. The, the TECs for the laser diodes not run so cold. Uh, second thing is, uh, the uh, port in the back here, where the cable goes in, uh, this isn't sealed properly at all. So I want to get some polyurethane or some silicone uh, two-part mix, something that won't outgas. I want to make sure that there's a nice seal in the back section here uh, once the laser is operating as it should be. So the first thing to do is to install the lenses in the lens carriers. So let's get into that. Now to start with the delicate task of mounting lenses into carriers. So there's uh, four lenses that I need to mount and uh, that'll give me two extra. So here are my lenses right here and here are my carriers. Now to help with this task, I made myself a little lens tweezers right here. A very handy tool to have. And it has four prongs, so that way the lens can't go flying. Because we're not going to play lens flying games today. Got uh, the epoxy here. And uh, we're going to get going on that. So first step is to mix the hardener with the epoxy. And there we go. Nice squishy sound. And now the clock is going to start. Alright. Mix that together. And with epoxies, you want to really, really thoroughly mix the epoxies. So better you mix the epoxy, better it's going to work. And uh, overall, uh, the more even strength and stick you'll get. Plus, you won't get uh, unmixed stuff. It's still liquid. And we're going to mix this up pretty good. Mix, 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 mix. All right, the epoxy is mixed. Now we... Start dropping lenses into carriers. Well, I'm going to put a glove on one hand. The reason why I have a glove on this hand is because I don't want the moisture from my fingers to get on the lenses as I'm holding the carriers. This hand I'm not going to put a glove on because I want to keep the dexterity of this hand and I have a glove interfere with that. So I'm going to go ahead and pick up one of the lens carriers. And uh, you want to put just the tiniest amount of the epoxy in there you think you're putting too much and you're putting too much you sh you should be at the point where you barely see uh, none of the epoxy in there actually so a little bit on the, the side wall here
All right, we're gonna get rid of the uh, extra epoxy in there now. Here we go. I got a very thin layer of epoxy in there. I grab my special tweezers, these guys, and pick up the lens. Oh, pick up a lens. Carefully. All right, now we got to put the lens in the carrier. And uh, try not to get any of the epoxy on the lens, which is the hardest thing to do. All right, so you see the lens moved off to the side. I got a little silicone tip tool here that I made. And now uh, we can just adjust the lens that way. Come up from the bottom. Very careful not to get epoxy on this tool. And in just like that. Up to the other lenses. Well, those lenses look all put together. And, uh... Now I just need to wait until they set, and uh, we can get into the rest of the laser. Now we can continue from where I left off in the part one video, and that is setting the focus. So I moved the entire laser out to a different room, so I have a larger field of reflection. So the laser is here, I have a mirror in the other room over there, and I have my white material here. And this will give me a reflected distance of about 75 foot, or 22, 23 meters-ish. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the far field focus. I have some epoxy and I'm going to set just a little dab of epoxy on the top of each one of the lenses like it was there originally. This will lock the lenses in place. Well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure the focus is good. I'll turn on the laser. And we don't want to run it all too long because the TETs are still rather cool and I don't want condensation to get in while I'm focusing. All right, so Turn up the laser a little bit, a little bit more. There we go. We can see uh, the laser beam output here. It'll be about uh, 50 mil, but that'll get squeezed down uh, after it goes through the anamorphic prism pair. We got one more output on the top that you can't see, but I can see it, so that's good. Okay, so the focus looks pretty okay. Uh, any kind of little adjustment or wiggle in the lenses, you'll see I'll have a dramatic point at this uh, area. So if I touch one of the lenses just a little bit, you can see how much it changes. So I've got to be very careful with that. So I'm going to put some of the epoxy right on top of each one of the lenses very carefully. All right, and I'm going to very quickly uh, set the focus of the uh, lasers as best as I can before any condensation sets on the optics. So let's see which one needs adjustment. Yeah, they all look pretty pretty good right now so I'm gonna let the epoxy set and make routine checks to see if the lenses have wandered off as the epoxy is curing but uh, that's that's pretty consistent and uh, maybe I'll make some little adjustments see if I can get better output but overall we're happy with that now that I set the focus on those four lasers, I want to go over the knife edge arrangement and discuss how to align those optics. Bear with me, it's a little complicated, but I hope to make this easy to understand and I've drawn some diagrams to help us out with that. Alright, so here are those four lasers right here, and here's the beam that comes out of each one of those lasers. These lines right here are the knife edging mirrors, and this is the one mirror that directs those outputs up and then out to the quarter wave rotator plate. Is a very simple knife edge to set up. There's only one row of four that we need to stack side by side like this. There's no columns to worry about, so easy to understand just four beams side by side. Now, doing a knife edge arrangement can be a little tricky, 
because there are three different axes or adjustment points on each one of those mounts that you can do. And I'm going to explain those points of adjustment so that way you understand. All right, so here's one of those mounts. And it's a very simple mount. There's not much to it. But let's go over the points of adjustment. You'll notice that there are two screws in the middle. This top screw right here. If you just focus, there you go. This top screw right here. That actually ends up being the one that sets the adjustment uh, for the mirror to go this way. And then how it works is uh, it goes through this side of the brass. And then on this side, it's threaded. So if you were to tighten this screw, it would bring the mirror down like this. And that's one point of vertical adjustment. Now, there's also a little set screw right here, and that also has a lot to do with the vertical adjustment as well. That set screw pushes the mirror up when you tighten it like this. So it's kind of a dance between the top screw and the bottom screw. So normally what I do is uh, I'll undo this top screw so that way it's pretty loose. And I'll set the adjustment with the bottom set screw first and then tighten the top screw so that way everything is locked into position. But you may have to go back and forth between each one of these to set the vertical adjustment precisely where it needs to be. Just make sure it's all good and tight before you seal up the laser. Now, the second point of adjustment is the rotation around the screw like this, which is one of the horizontal adjustments you can make inside of the laser. There's another horizontal adjustment, which is the motion of the block like this in this cutout. It can be best described as rotation versus strafe. So, for example, here's my diagram for that. Now here's a laser coming out like this, and this is the um, adjustment point of that mirror on that cutout. So the mirror mount would be faced like this and allowed to move in and out on this axis line right here. I've drawn an arrow for that. What that allows us to do is it shifts the beam position without rotation. So for example, rotation would shift the beam like this and this adjustment point right here allows us to shift the beam up and down like this or side to side. And that allows us to set where we want these beams to be. So we start with the first one and we pretty much figure, okay, where, where does this beam need to be? And then we go, okay, well, it needs to be over here on this side of the mirror and over here and out. So we set this one, and then the ones that follow afterwards, we just clip the very edge of the mirror this way. Now think about it like this. If you slide the mirror uh, in uh, this way, you're going to clip the beam. So you start with the mirror in closer. You keep pulling it out until it's not clipping the beam. And then that adjustment is done um, on this adjustment point here. Now you have the other adjustment of the rotation and you can rotate the beam this way. So it's kind of a play. So when you do the adjustments, uh, the first thing is, is to set the mirror in, figure out at which point where it starts clipping, you back it off. So you pull it uh, further away on that way until it stops clipping the mirror. And at one point when it stops clipping the mirror, then you do the uh, rotational adjustment, which will set how the, uh, the beam is coming out this way and then the last the last adjustment is the vertical so when you get the beam lined up like this and then you can align the beams vertical position and get everything squared up for the most part i already did the alignment on this side of the laser but i've undid the alignment on this one and i'm going to show you the steps that i take when i'm doing a knife edge arrangement so first thing as i said i know that this mirror has to reflect the laser off on uh, this side of the reflector so this is going to be uh, the first beam on this side, which means that this one's going to be the last beam on this side. You'll know what I'm talking about as soon as you see it on the quarter wave rotator plate. Let's go ahead and turn on the laser. I don't have to turn on the cooler because I'm going to be running the laser at a pretty low power. And I've disconnected the thermoelectric cooler so that way I don't get condensation on the laser, the optics. So, yeah, turn it on. There we go. Zoom in a little bit. All right, so... First adjustment, sliding the mirror in. So let's go ahead and do that. Now I'm gonna push the mirror in until it starts clipping the beam. 
when it starts dipping the beam, you can see that the mirror starts to light up, and that's because uh, the light from the other lasers will actually start hitting the uh, side of the glass. So you know it uh, should be moved out from this point. Let's move it out a little bit. So now it's no longer uh, clipping as much. Let's go ahead and uh, do the rotational adjustment now. And uh, we're going to have to go back and forth between these adjustments a little bit just to make sure that everything is in the right place. So let's go ahead and uh, do that. Now I want it to be the last dot on there. So watch carefully on the quarter wave rotator plate as I move this. I'll stick this in the little hole on the bottom. I'm going to watch carefully as well. Alright, so clipping the beam a little bit again, but now it's the last uh, output on the quarter wave rotator plate to the left. So I'm going to have to move that adjustment out just a little bit more. That's the rotational adjustment. All right, that's pretty close. I'll take a good look at it after I'm done with the demonstration, but uh, that's good enough for now. I'm gonna lock that into position. And as I said, the last adjustment then is the vertical adjustment. So, let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'm going to zoom out. Alright, so the vertical adjustment, as I said, is this, this top screw here and the set screw underneath it. I've already loosened the top screw, so that way I can adjust the set screw. Let's go ahead and take a look at what that does. Let's flip this up real quick. Alright. Now over here, we have these two beams. So I'm going to put the little Allen wrench in where the set screw is, and I'm going to give the set screw a turn. Since I want the beam to go up, I'm going to drive the set screw in, which will raise the mirror. So, there we go. I got it now. All right, so. Pushing the set screw in, see the output go up. And uh, I'm going to make uh, an adjustment to the rotational axes. Alright, so. That's how you do a knife edge arrangement, as I said. First one is, is to uh, strafe the beam by moving the bracket in and out. Make sure that you're not clipping the other laser beams. Then you're going to do the rotational adjustment, which will allow you to move it back and forth after you make sure that all the laser beams are lined up. And the last adjustment to make is the vertical adjustment. That's where you get a very nice laser output just like that. Okay, well, now that I'm done with that, I'm going to take a look uh, over the alignment. Make sure that's all good, tighten everything down, and then I'm going to set the focus on the other four laser diodes. Here I am again in the other room, and I've just finished doing all the optical alignment inside of this laser. And the reason why I'm out here is not only did I do the uh, near field optical alignment, but I also did the far field optical alignment. And this area gives me a longer distance of which to reflect the laser. So my total laser reflection length, once again, is about 75 foot or 23 meters. Let me go over the uh, whole entire optical train, just as I did in part one of this uh, video series, whatnot. Uh, anyway, so we got uh, four lasers on top and bottom. We got our knife edge reflectors here. We got a, got a quarter wave rotator plate. 
So what this piece does is it changes the optical polarization by 90 degrees. So anything that is say in a horizontal component will get changed to vertical, uh, optically polarized. Anything that is vertically polarized will get reflected off the thin foam layer inside the polarized beam splitting cube out and uh, that'll come out at 90 degrees. These are still in the horizontal uh, polarization because they didn't go through a wave rotator plate and anything in the horizontal polarization will just go right through the polarized beam splitting cube just as it were a regular piece of glass. So that's how a polarized beam splitting cube works. Uh, anyway, let's take a look at the results. I'll turn on the laser. Let's see. You want to turn on the laser? Yes. All right, so there's our output. Uh, the output's about, say, 35 millimeters by 10 millimeters, so that's pretty good. A little bit of cast off from the uh, diodes, but overall looks really good. Just a lot of uh, cast off. There you go. That gives you a better uh, representation of what that beam really looks like. No. Put my thumb in there for comparison. No. That's not bad for eight laser diodes at 75 foot away, especially for being uh, big multi mold laser diodes. Now it's time to set the current on the laser diode drivers. So I'm going to go through how to do that on one of the outputs. There's four outputs that I have to adjust. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put my meter in series with the output of the laser diode driver and the laser diodes. So this common gets connected to the negative output and this gets connected to the negative wire that goes to the laser diode drivers. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to pull off this negative. Put my common wire on the negative. So I'm going to put the positive wire going into the meter on the negative wire going to the laser diodes. Make sure nothing is touching while I'm doing this. See if I can sneak this up here. Yes, I can. You, you get out of the way. Stay. Stay. Bad wire. Oh, you just don't want to uh, cooperate. Look at that. A solution in every corner. All right, now. Gonna set the meter into amps DC. And we're gonna turn on the laser and then make our adjustment. So first, uh, make sure that's down, yep. Turn on the laser. I turn on the cooler too. All right, now we turn up the laser power all the way. Uh, we can adjust the current output with this little potentiometer here, so. We bring it up to one from 1.17 all the way up to 2.5. Sorry, 1.25. Just like that, we're good. I'm gonna turn down the laser. And then turn it off. You're gonna turn off the cooler. I turn it down just to load. There we go. All right. Now all you have to do is reconnect the laser diode up the way it was. and then do the other three. So, oh, pretty simple. Let's try sealing up this laser head. Now, I have my two-part silicone mix here. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. I don't have much experience with working with silicone, but the experience that I do have tells me that natural is better. Now, uh, yeah, looks to be about 50 milliliters. So, put 25 mil in each one of these syringes and then uh, mix it together.
All right, that looks pretty thoroughly mixed. All right, so to prepare the laser head, what I have done is uh, I have some wax here in the back, and I'm gonna pull the laser head off the cooler. I'm gonna tilt it sideways, and I'm gonna inject the silicone mix in the back of the laser head. Actually change this glove first. So I don't get silicone everywhere. And that's a place for a mess. Okay. All right. Now, pull the laser head off. Actually get this prepared first. May as well. Now we pour it in and uh, hope for the best. All right, I noticed that I put three little standoffs on the laser. That's so I can lean it like this and make sure that the uh, silicone runs down. So just like this. And then we'll let it set and see how it turns out. Now it's been a couple of hours and the silicone on the back of the laser head has set and it's giving me a nice flush seal along with this gasket here and that should prevent moisture from getting inside of the laser head. In addition to that, I'll probably toss in a couple of desiccant packs just to make sure that any moisture that does get in there doesn't collect on the optics and instead gets absorbed by those packets. In part one of this uh, video series, we went from three and a half watts all the way up to six and a half watts after changing the laser diodes. In this video, I have replaced the lenses, I have turned up the current and I have done the alignment of the optics. So from six and a half watts, how much power have we gotten? Well, time to turn up the laser and see. Here's my laser power meter. Uh, this is the watts. This is the decimal point, the tenths of watts and hundredths of watts. Turn up the power. Oh yeah, it's over 9,000 milliwatts. Yeah. Ooh, instant flame. There's one more problem to solve inside of the laser, and that is that the TECs are set too cold. Now, inside of the laser, there is a thermistor, which is connected to these two wires right here. And the thermistors can come in either positive temperature coefficient or negative temperature coefficient positive temperature coefficient is where it gets more resistive as it warms up. Negative temperature coefficient means it gets less resistive as it warms up. And uh, the way you can tell what your laser has is if you put your laser in a cold environment and uh, the resistance goes up, that's a negative temperature coefficient. If the resistance goes down, that's positive temperature coefficient. Now, the one inside this laser is negative temperature coefficient, and that means that we can make it run a little warmer by adding resistance in the loop in series with the uh, thermistor on the inside. That's why I have these resistors right here. Now I found out that uh, 2K added is uh, what gives us a running temperature near room temperature and I'm going to have it run a little cooler so I'm going to throw in a 1700 ohm resistor which will run it a little below room temperature but not as cold as it runs now. Uh, and if I wanted to make it run cooler, what I would do is I would throw resistance in uh, parallel with these two wires, not in series. Now, since I wanted to run warmer, I'm going to go ahead and uh, add in the proper resistance, which I said is going to be 1700 ohms. All right, so... Take that off. Get some heat shrink. 
Where are my side cutters? I have no idea. That'll work. I'm going to cut that off. All right. No. I don't want to add the resistor directly on here because I don't want it to flex. So I'm actually going to cut a portion of this wire off and I'm going to put the resistor on the wire so that way if it flex um, it won't break the resistor off as easily so I'm going to cut a portion of this wire just like that alright and then strip this section as well Time to solder in a resistor. Perfect. Put a little super glue on the resistor right there. It said uh, this will help stiffen the uh, the wire and make sure that the leads on the resistor doesn't doesn't flex, and that'll get, add some uh, some structural support to this. All right, uh, that's done. Time to shrinkify those wires. All right. And that is that. Well, the laser is done. Good to go. Give it one final check. Make sure that the temperature is uh, set correctly. And uh, ship it off to its rightful owner. Right, looks good. Okay. One more thing I must show you is how it looks on the inside. Because uh, that'll give you a good idea of how the optical train is set up and uh, what it should look like when it's done. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. All good to go. On. All right. Let me show you what the inside of this laser looks like now not that it looks much different but it looks pretty all right I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the shop light real quick Is that running oh yeah it's running nice all right off we go I'm gonna blow a little bit of uh, fog in there so you can see the beam path Yeah, that is very nicely done. Good job. Alright, so here we are at the shop. We got a larger laser power meter here so we can more accurately test the full optical wattage coming off the laser. So let's go on and uh, do that test. We're going to bring up the modulation to 
0.95 volts. And here's the optical wattage on this meter here. 4.95, enter. Engage. Engage. Well, we're pulling max current. They could do better than that. <laughs> yeah, it was up uh, It was up past 10 for a little bit. Yeah. Okay, well, larger power supply. It larger is. power supply needed. All right, so we have the laser now hooked up to a power supply that's limited to 25 amps, and that should hopefully be enough current to run this thing. So let's see what the full optical wattage is now. All right, so we're going to go to 4.95. Yep. 4.95. Here we go. Where's enter? There's enter. Aha. Yeah, there you go. Little over 10 watts of blue. Nice. Yeah, that looks real nice. That looks great. And now for the final touch, Kavant was kind enough to send us new stickers to place on the laser. <laughs> I got it. Hey, better you do this than me. <laughs> Tape is my nemesis. Got it. Beautiful. Now, of course, because I have a working idea of why the Kali Mini lenses failed, I'm going to use the scientific method and figure out whether I have right or not. So I have an experiment set up here to test just that. I mounted in one of the blue laser dials from the laser head in this brass block right here. And that's on a CPU uh, spreader top plate. And I used another one to just raise the height of the laser um, from the cooler. There's a 50 by 50 millimeter thermal electric cooler underneath. And that is on this copper heat sink right here. This blower fan just uh, passes air on the fins of the heat sink. Make sure that that's cool. I have an analog laser driver set up here to run the laser diode inside of the mount. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the thermoelectric cooler and I'm going to see if moisture condenses on the lens. So I have a switch here that'll control the 5 volts going to the thermoelectric cooler. We should normalize switches like this. Scientific clunky switches. That's satisfying. Um, yeah, it's getting colder. It could take a while. I'm in Wisconsin. It's November and it's not very high humidity right now. So I know we should see something. I'm going to turn on the laser. I figure I'm going to run it at about uh, 300, 400 milliwatts. Uh, that should produce about the same heat as the typical use in an RGB uh, show laser because uh, it's going to be on one third of the time. And we'll let it run like that and see if there's any uh, moisture that builds up on the lens. This is one of the cleaner lenses that I managed to uh, get. So, a pretty decent output. Turn off the light. Oh, hey. say hi to the new laser damage on my camera. It takes the, uh, the photons, my retinas refuse to. Go ahead and uh, get a better look on that beam profile. So it's not perfectly clean. Uh, it's not bad. And of course, I'm going to do some tests. We're going to see exactly uh, what works to remove a damaged um, anti-reflective coating on those lenses. But it's uh, still pretty decent results. I'm actually rather impressed. I've been running this test now for about two hours, and you can see there's a lot of condensation on the uh, setup. Well, how much condensation is on the lens? Da 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 da. Almost none, surprisingly. Uh, the output still looks pretty clean too. I don't see any uh, distortion or uh, noise generated by droplets yet. At this point, I've been running the laser now for about four hours, but the time doesn't matter because I've learned what I needed to learn and we're gonna see something really cool. Now I have the camera in uh, pro mode, but that is because I need to control the parameters of things I need to show you. All right, so here's the setup. Let's get that 
visible. Now, what's interesting is that even though there's a lot of uh, moisture that's built up on the outside, there's uh, no moisture that's really built up on the lens. And this is my first observation. So it was interesting. So I thought, okay, well the lenses must remain dry during operation because the uh, the lasers are running and they're heating up the lens. So I'm going to turn off the uh, laser, turn on mod modulation, and uh, we're going to take a look and see if there's any frosting that occurs on the front of that uh, laser. That's horrible. I need to grab a light. And uh, it looks pretty clean. So far, no moisture. So I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. So when does the, uh, the lens actually get wet? So I turned off the, uh, the thermal electric cooler and uh, what that does, it stops cooling the uh, the laser assembly, but it also warms up. So any time now, there it goes. So it seems like that the lens ends up getting wet when the laser is turned off. This is really interesting. You can clearly see the moisture. Uh, the lens will start looking more and more opaque as uh, as it warms up and the moisture collects. All right, everybody, it's time to get out your chemistry sets and follow along. Now, the problem with these lenses that were originally in the laser head was that the anti-reflective coating on the front of the lens started to degrade, probably because of the water they got on the lenses. And so I want to try to remove the entirety of the coating on the lens and therefore somewhat restore the lenses to a usable condition. Now, with the four that I had cleaned earlier in the video, um, what I ended up using was a concentrated sulfuric acid. That worked pretty well, but some of the coating still is on the lens. Uh, on this side, I have the three lenses that I pulled from the other side of the laser that are still fully damaged. I ended up breaking one of the lenses um, just to see how it was glued in the lens carrier. And uh, yeah, found out the hard way. That's glued in pretty well. And it's uh, interesting to note that it's a crown and flint lens. So uh, two different uh, portions of um, glass that are glued together. Uh, I take, that's a tangent. Uh, anyway, so let's go through the chemicals that I have. Uh, in this blue bottle right here, I have a concentrated um, sodium hydroxide solution. Lye, very basic. I have more concentrated sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, and I have uh, some salt solutions. So I have um, copper, I was at uh, chloride, and then I have strontium chloride. So that's what I'm going to use. Yeah. Now let's get to these first and uh, test out the. Um, the ones that aren't sulfuric. So on the top lens, I'm going to try some of the hydrochloric acid. Now uh, let's move over to uh, using the sodium hydroxide, the basic solution. None of these should be made into uh, scratch and sniff stickers. All these chemicals are pretty, uh, pretty corrosive. Sorry for the random jump cut, but I was having problems getting the liquid out of the little glass rods because of capillary action and needed to find something to uh, squeeze air through the top of the tube and get it out. Uh, anyway, I continued on. Um, so let me go over what I have. 
Uh, in this top one, I have the hydrochloric acid. In this one, I have the sodium hydroxide, the lye solution. This one right here is the uh, strontium chloride salt. This is copper chloride salt. Up here is just the concentrated um, sulfuric acid. This one is just hydrochloric acid. And this one right here is a mix of the hydrochloric and sulfuric acid. So I'm going to let these set for a while, kind of tend to them and make sure they don't dry out. And we'll come back and uh, see what the results are. It's been about three hours, so let's go ahead and check on the experiments. Line camera action away. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, hydrochloric acid only one. Uh, you can see a little bit of the uh, copper uh, color come out of the brass because the other metal metals are being eaten away by the uh, acid, but uh, not much else. The one with the sodium hydroxide, much darker color on the brass, but uh, still hard to see any change in the uh, the lens area. Move over to this one, strontium chloride. Not much change at all. So, how about the copper chloride? That's done some interesting things. Looks like a little uh, witch's brewing pot. Let's move over to these. So. Just the sulfuric acid. Now, so you can see the uh, same discolorization, um, or you can see more of the copper color come out because uh, the other metals are being attacked by uh, the acid, uh, leaving the copper behind. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is just the um, hydrochloric. Doesn't look to be as powerful as the uh, sulfuric. And uh, over here, now this uh, looks promising because, uh, interestingly enough, the, the mix of the two acids uh, seems to be the only one that is eaten through the adhesive. Um, so, yeah, I'm wondering if that lens will uh, just pop out pretty easy after I've been cleaning them. So, let's go ahead and clean up the samples and see the results. All right, I'm gonna let these uh, lenses dry. And we'll take a look at them, compare them with the uh, before pictures. Given the various tests that I've performed with trying to find a solution to somewhat restore these lenses to a usable condition, it seemed like sulfuric acid gave me the best results. So I went ahead and I gave the lenses another treatment in sulfuric acid overnight. And uh, they do look okay, um, just visually to the eye, but when you get up close and personal with them, you can definitely see that they have quite a bit of damage still. Well, let's go ahead and take a closer inspection of those lenses. Here we go. Uh, these are in the order of uh, best results uh, to worst results, so take a close look on that. You can see that uh, it looks pretty good. Not a lot of damage on the surface. You can see some uh, little spots, but all in all pretty good. And continuing on, you'll notice that the lenses get worse and worse looking. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at these lenses under the microscope. Get a really good idea of just the um, amount of damage that still exists. You can see a lot of damage on that one. Going over to this one. Now you can see, see some of the damage there. And these two last ones are the worst ones uh, coming up. You can see quite a bit of damage on that one for sure. And over here, the worst one, right in the center of the lens. You know, quite a bit of damage. But, yeah, we're going to take a look at these under the microscope. I'm going to go over um, some of the problems that I would have trying to restore these lenses further. Uh, in simple terms, they are hopeless. Uh, I also want to show you another thing real quick, too, because that will help you understand what I'm pointing out when we're taking a look at these lenses under the microscope. And explain why we're seeing that. To do that, here's the microscope slide right here. 
and then I'm going to put another microscope slide right on top of it. And what this does is it makes a very thin air gap between the two slides. Kind of rub them together like that. And you should be able to see some lines. There you go. So you see those lines because of the, um, the interference of the reflections between the uh, two surfaces of the glass, uh, upper and lower, between uh, the air gap. And those are called Newton rings. You can learn more about how those work um, just by googling Newton rings. Really interesting though. But uh, we'll see some similar effects on the lenses when we take a look at those under the microscope. And for the same reason, um, air being trapped between uh, layers. So keep, in, keep that in mind. Yo dog, I heard you like lenses, so I put lenses underneath your lenses. And so now I have the color mending lenses underneath the microscope. We can go over them in detail and discuss how they failed and a little bit of the problems that I would have if I did try to restore these lenses and what that would involve. So I'm going to work my way from the best to worst again. We can take a look at uh, the damage. Um, and you can see on this lens already the interference that's generated by the uh, different coatings on the lens. Now normally you're not supposed to see this, but because the coating is in a state of failure, what seems to have happened is um, as the lens coating deteriorated, um, there were spots. So you can see a spot right there, and it seems like that has let air um, or water in, and it's pushed the coatings apart. So now you get that thin film uh, interference, same as the microscope lenses. So that's actually uh, physically separated. Um, and has air in there, I think. Um, now, I, I had success with the sulfuric acid quite a bit. However, it did not remove anything but the most top coating, it seems. So, there are coatings um, underneath made of a different material that I could not remove. So, it seems like I got the best results where the lenses were um, further up front from the back of the laser head where the moisture came in um, and only damaged that most top coating. But I can't fix the coatings underneath that. Once again this lens has the same problem. So the interference generated by the failure of the AR coating letting uh, air get in there um, or another failure of whatever um, adhesion there is but that's not good to see in lenses like that. That's a problem with the coating uh, coming apart. Oh yeah you can see so right there as it got bigger you can see that there's a crack in the coating that looks to be the entry point for where the air or water got in and started to uh, break the coating apart off the surface of the glass. Now um, to restore these lenses I would need to find a solution that would either eat away at the coating completely um, at which point I think it would might attack the glass underneath um, or I could try to remove the coating by abrasion. The problem is, is I'd have to find an abrasive material um, that would be softer than the glass underneath, and yet still able to attack the coating on the top. As we continue, you'll notice that the lenses will have scratches as well as having those rings. That's uh, partly uh, due to me trying to clean the lenses um, initially, and uh, so as the coating failed, I took pieces of that coating and dragged it across the coating. Of course, because of the same hardness, it was able to scratch into it. Well, moving on, now they're going to start getting real bad looking. Major uh, separation of those those layers, more cracks, so yeah, pretty damaged. It's uh, interesting how these uh, coatings fail too. I've noticed that they seem to be almost fibrous in different locations. Let's see if I can see that a little bit better. Now uh, the lenses seem to have uh, failed in a way where the ones that were further back in the laser head ended up getting more moisture on them and uh, they were damaged far worse. And you can see here the different layers in the coating. So there's a layer that's starting to come off. 
probably be the second layer underneath the layer that the sulfuric acid was able to attack. Let's take a look at that area a little bit more. That seems to be quite a few coatings. I wonder what that material is made out of. All right, let's take a look at the last and worst lens. So you can see that there are multiple layers and that the acid doesn't seem to want to attack whatever material that is. Um, it does seem like the uh, copper chloride may have a chance of um, freeing that up though. Uh, let's take a look at that in more detail. Yeah, those are scratches that I probably put on there. As I said, parts of the coating obviously came loose as I was cleaning it and started scratching the surface. Oh yeah, these lenses, uh, these lenses are toast. Alas, my fellow Xenodilodonians, we've reached the end of yet another laser video, and I must bid you farewell for the time being. The next video coming up regarding lasers should be about the Mellis Griot 488nm GPSS laser heads. These things are absolutely fantastic and produce some of the finest photons I have ever seen. So be excited to see that. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, stay tuned for more.